Golden State Media Concepts bring you the Bible Study Podcast. Reflect and journey the Bible as together we study God's Word and be inspired. Bible study made fun and informative for all ages. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Bible Study Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am happy to be back with you for this second part of our episode, focusing on the lectionary texts assigned for the week of August, August, oh my goodness, the week of April 8th, and that is the second Sunday of Easter. So the on the first part of the episode, we talked about the reading from Acts and the reading from the book of Psalms, um, that was Psalm 133. And now we're moving on to, I normally say the New Testament texts, but because we're in the season of Easter and we have replaced the Old Testament uh, first reading with the um, texts from Acts, Acts, I can't quite say that because we did have New Testament in the first half of this episode, but we are moving on to what would normally be the New Testament readings of the lectionary cycle. And you know, if if you are new to this podcast, then I, I haven't actually said this for a while, so I'll say it again. The lectionary is a three-year cycle of assigned biblical readings that um, many churches follow. I am using those for this podcast to give me some direction in terms of what texts to look at each week. Normally, it is an Old Testament lesson, a, a psalm, um, a reading from the Psalms, a New Testament lesson, and then the gospel, a reading from one of the four gospels. As I said in a little bit in this podcast and earlier in the first half of this episode, during the season of Easter, we replace that Old Testament text with a reading from Acts. So we begin to see that early church forming and uh, what that early church looked like, how they were continuing Jesus's ministry, etc. So that's just a very brief description of the lectionary texts, uh, in case you were wondering how I choose what I'm going to talk about each week. I like the, I like knowing what's coming up, although it does get a little frustrating at times. And this is one of those weeks because the second Sunday of Easter, no matter what year in the lectionary cycle you are in, and we are currently in year B, the second Sunday of Easter is always, 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 the Doubting Thomas story. So every year, the second Sunday of Easter, you, um, if you are a pastor, you are preaching on the Doubting Thomas story. And normally, because it's a three-year cycle, then you have rotating texts, but that one shows up every year. So, uh, so in some ways, you know, it's hard to find something you haven't said already. <laughs> and in other ways, uh, there's always something new to be found in the scriptures. So it's kind of a give and take. But we are going to get to that lesson a little later, that gospel reading a little bit later, where we will start with the lesson from First John, that is the New Testament text assigned for today. That text comes to us from First John chapter 1, verses, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 2. We declare to you that to you what was from the beginning what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the father and was revealed to us. We declare to you that we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. 
If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Again, that is the reading from First John uh, chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 2. I, I like there's some great symmetry happening there. There's a lot of familiar things in this uh, in this reading, you may recognize some of it if you go to a literary based a literary geez a liturgy based <laughs> church uh, where you speak um, the same liturgy each week or some variation on the liturgy. You may recognize um, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is extremely familiar to me because it was the was part of the confession and absolution in my own tradition, the Lutheran tradition. And the new hymnal came out when I was three years old. It came out in 1978. And so I had a lot of the liturgy memorized before I could actually read. So that is very familiar to me. Um, I also know that that is part of the Episcopalian worship service. Um, some some of those rites, it's in there, uh, in their collect for purity. So it shows up in various liturgies. Maybe it sounds familiar to you. Another thing that I notice in here is the um, images of darkness and light, and that is common in the Gospel of John. So that's a definite connection between the book of John, uh, First John in this case, and the Gospel of John. But you can also see why this text is assigned during the Easter season, right? Because it's talking about Jesus being the... Um, atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only our sins, but for the sins of the entire world. And if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And I've said this before, but I'll, I'll say it again here. Um, I know that there are people who are uncomfortable with this idea of sin. They don't want to talk about sin. Um, some people that I've talked to don't like the idea of attending church because they feel like they're just made to feel terrible for what they've done. And in some ways, I can understand where they're coming from. But for me, it's it's pretty much the opposite. The ability to confess my sins and receive absolution. And in the Lutheran church, we do that as corporate confession. We do that together during the worship service, I, uh, you know, Catholics have individual confession that, where they can go speak to the priest and receive their absolution that way, just different ways of doing the same thing. But for me, being able to publicly say I have done things that I wish I hadn't, or I haven't done things that maybe I should have, or I've said things that hurt people, etc., and then having the pastor, the priest, etc., say to me, your sins are forgiven. God, you are a child of God. God loves you. And because of the promises of the resurrection of Christ, your sins are forgiven. And yeah, it can be, it can be terrible to think about those things that I've done, those things that I haven't done, the things that I've said that I shouldn't have, and all of those things that we do, but no one's perfect. And not wanting to talk about sin because it makes you feel bad. It's just to ignore that sin exists in the world. And if you don't like the word sin, you know, just think of it. All of us make mistakes. All of us make bad choices. All of us do things that we shouldn't do or that we didn't think through or whatever it is. So we all sin. We all act in ways that are selfish, that are maybe not in the best interests of our neighbors. It there's all of these things that we do in life, and that is sin. I mean, that's just that's just what it is. So to have this confession, the ability to confess, and to know that I still am a child of God, that there is nothing that can separate me from the love that God has for me, is greatly comforting to me. 
So when people say they don't like to talk about sin, they don't, um, they don't want to go to church because they don't want to be made to feel bad. Um, part of me doesn't understand that. There is the part of me that does understand um, when we are judged in a church setting by people who can act as though they are somehow less sinful than us or who like to throw our sins in our face, even though that's pretty hypocritical. Uh, I can understand that. And that unfortunately does happen in a lot of communities. It happens in Christian communities. It happens in secular communities. It happens. We, again, are human and we make poor choices and we say things that hurt other people. So I do understand that aspect of it. But the ability to say, oh my gosh, I have sinned and God still loves me is amazing. This doesn't mean that I'm off the hook. This doesn't mean that I can just go out and sin with abandon and then not ever worry about the consequences. No, because God's love for me then needs to be shared with others. And so that love, in in terms of sharing that love with others, I might need to ask for forgiveness from them as well, or apologize for the things that I've done that have hurt someone, etc., etc. And I said etc. a lot. It's like I'm channeling the king from The King and I. Um, sorry, random movie reference. At any rate, so First John, a little bit more about this book, and I would like to look at some commentary, which we will do in a few minutes, but we are going to take our first break of the podcast. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Bible Study Podcast. And I will be right back. Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Bible Study Podcast. We are speaking today about the text assigned for, well, at least the second of the four texts assigned for the, again, second half. It's not the second, it's the third and fourth texts assigned from the four lectionary texts that are assigned for the second Sunday of Easter. This year that falls on the Sunday of August 8th. August, seriously, what is going on with me today? Let's try this again. April 8th. It's April. Not yet August. Not ready for August. Thank thank you very much. So what are we doing? We are discussing the second half of the four readings assigned for the week of April 8th, the second Sunday of Easter. Third and fourth readings, readings from 1st John and the Gospel of John. So before the break, we read that reading from 1st John. Uh, that was First John chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 2, verse 2. And then I said I wanted to do um, look at a little bit of commentary on that text. And this commentary comes from Sherry Brown, who is the Assistant Professor of New Testament at Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. Is it Creighton or Creighton? I don't know the answer to that, but it's one of those two, I would imagine. And she gives us a little bit of background on this epistle, the, the letter of First John. She says that early church leaders referred to First John as a Catholic epistle. That's Catholic with a lowercase c. So Catholic with a lowercase c usually means universal or general. So this is a general letter because of its formal treatise-like tone and lack of personal address or distinctive audience. So as opposed to um, many of the letters that are attributed to Paul, where he is writing to a specific community and he begins the letter by addressing that specific community, this is more general. It could be read in, you know, any number of churches because it doesn't have that formal, distinctive um, address or, or audience. She says, in fact... 
The prominence of 1 John eventually led to the group of more universal letters in the New Testament known as the Catholic Epistles. In addition, the relationship between 1 John and the Gospel of John becomes evident across the first verses of the letter. Those are the the verses that we read today. The evangelist's language of love, knowledge, and the gift of truth for the children of God permeates these pages, but culminate in a more grounded and direct plea for, scholars suggest, the same general community. She goes on to say that most scholars suggest the letters, remember there are three um, letters of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Um, many scholars suggest that the letters were were written about a decade after the Gospels to address a later threat that was fracturing the Johannine community of churches. Additional details of the world behind these texts must be gleaned from the expressed concerns. So 1st John Um, Chapter 2, verses 19 through 23, a little later than what we read today, indicates a schism has occurred in the community that is based on the denial of Jesus as the Christ. 2 John, chapters 7 through 9, clarifies the Christological crisis in terms of incarnation. Those who have left reject the claim that Jesus was fully human. In distress, the author calls them antichrists that is anti-Christian in that they are falling for these newfangled ideas and not adhering to the tradition they received. This suggests some members of the community have been attracted to Gnosticism, a Hellenistic uh, or Greek form of Christianity developing in the early second century and eventually deemed heresy. And then the last little bit of this commentary that I want to read is as follows. Um, Sherry Brown says, the author's overarching purpose in writing these epistles, therefore, is to root out these splintering notions and urge unity in the community. Further exploration of 1 John's structure reveals a prologue that mirrors that of the Gospel of John, while the final verses likewise echo the Gospel's concluding sounds. Within this theological frame, the author makes three resounding appeals to the new community in terms of the characteristics of God that form the heart and soul of God's children. Light, justice, and love. They warn the community of the dangers of the world while instructing on the power of faith to conquer all for those who abide in Christ and thus remain in the new covenant community. Today's passage covers the prologue and the first segment of the opening appeal. So I thought that was very interesting and very helpful in giving us some context for 1 John. So addressing some issues that are arising about 10 years, maybe after the writing of the gospel. And it's interesting to see that already so soon in the early church, we are having this schism and Of course, because people are trying to, you know, it's not like they actually had the Bible as we know it, and they had that in front of them. That was all still being formed and written and and put together. So there are a lot of conflicting ideas in the in the early church about what Jesus was and wasn't. And even though they had many eyewitnesses, eyewitness accounts. If you're, um, you know, that those accounts could vary in terms of who you heard them from. Let's say you heard from one apostle who interpreted it this way. Um, A community over here in a different area heard from another apostle who interpreted what he saw this in a different, slightly different way. So you get these arguments and you get these different misunderstandings or different ways of understanding what actually happened in Jesus's ministry. And so this is over the fact that the schism is over the denial of Jesus as the Christ, um, claiming that Jesus, they've, the people who have left reject the claim that Jesus was fully human. Um, so this is, this is what this letter is addressing, but you get those three themes, love, justice, and, um, light. And you see light, of course, In the text that we read today, the light in the darkness, if you are familiar with the Gospel of John, you know that that's the way it starts, that um, 
Jesus is the light in the darkness, that Jesus um, is the light who has been around since the beginning. Uh, you, if you think back to the opening verse of the Gospel of John, um, you know, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. And that's the way it, you know, we, we get that image that the light is coming into the world. And we read that a lot in the season of Advent as we're preparing for the birth of Jesus and that light coming into the world. So that is, that is the gospel or that is the reading from first John. And we now move on to the gospel of John, that reading, that problematic reading. It's not problematic. It's just frustrating for me because I think Thomas gets a bad rap, but let's go ahead and read the gospel assigned for today. That is from John chapter 20 verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. So that's the Gospel of John from ver uh, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. And I'm going to be talking a little bit more about that text when we come back. We are going to take our second break of the podcast. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Bible Study Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Bible Study Podcast. Before the break, we read the text assigned for this week, the gospel text assigned for this week, um, from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. That is the story of um, what has become, been come, what has come to be known as Doubting Thomas. Poor Thomas does not just get to be Thomas. He is forever doubting Thomas. But, and, and I've... I don't know if I've said this before on the podcast, but probably I just, I feel bad for Thomas because he does get that label and Peter spends a lot of the gospel saying things that people find ridiculous. And yet we don't 
give him a label. <laughs> He's just Peter. Uh, he is the rock, which is either interpreted as the, the, the strong foundation upon which Christ will build his church or uh, the rock uh, in terms of he's as dense as a rock so he does get a little bit of um flack thrown his way but not as much as thomas and he's not nearly as cool as the rock who is now an actor but that's beside the point so um i do want to look at some commentary for this because i feel like i've said the same things about thomas every time this text comes up and that is i completely understand he wasn't there. He didn't see. I mean, he's just asking for the same thing that the disciples have already, the other disciples have already had. They saw Jesus. So it's easy for them to be like, well, you don't believe, you, can, you know, you have to see to believe, but they've already seen. And then doubt people, people take this text often to believe that doubt is the opposite of faith, which is not true. Doubt can lead to stronger faith because it leads to asking questions asking questions leads to new knowledge, etc. So um, certainty can be the opposite of faith because when you're so certain you know what's right and what's true, you don't have that open mind. So doubt is actually healthier in terms of faith. But I want to look at some commentary and this commentary comes to us from Mary Hinkle Shore, who is the pastor of the Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd in Brevard, North Carolina. And so Mary writes... Maybe you've had this experience. One of your friends comes back from seeing a movie or going to a concert or visiting a beautiful place and says to you, you have got to see this. You listen with interest, even as you are trying to distinguish between what is hype and what is real. As a side note, I totally get this because I always take those things, you know, when something is so hyped, everyone loves it. I'm like, hmm, yeah, it's, it's so hyped. Is it going to live up to the hype, right? She says, it's not exactly right to say that you don't believe the testimony of your friends. It's more that you don't have any experience of your own to compare to theirs. To know what you believe about what they're reporting, you will have to go to the movie or try the product or see the sunset in that particular spot. In order to offer your own testimony, you need to have your own experience. And I just want to inject here. Thank you, Mary, for saying this, because it's exactly how I feel about Doubting Thomas. Um, she continues, the evangelist John knows this. John's gospel exhibits a pattern in which someone hears about Jesus and needs more, then receives what they need to come to their own experience of the life Jesus is embodying in the world. The earliest example is in John 1, when Philip says to Nathaniel, we have, ha we have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. That's John chapter 1 verse 45. And Nathaniel replies with skepticism. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? All Philip can do or can say in reply is come and see. Nathaniel will have to encounter Jesus and draw his own conclusion, which in fact he does. Within three verses, Nathaniel is saying, Jesus, saying to Jesus, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. She then goes on to talk about the woman at the well who, you know, is skeptical when she meets Jesus and he, Jesus knows so much about her. She then goes and tells all of her, all of her friends and neighbors and community, I have, I've met the Messiah. He knew things about me that he, he couldn't have possibly known. She tells him about this amazing experience. And then she, you know, she says, I, I've met a man who told me everything I have ever done. And then others come to see for themselves. You know, they, they may or may not believe what the woman has told them. And John writes that many of them believed on the basis of the woman's report and many more believed because they heard Jesus themselves. The story ends with some of them saying to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. That's in John chapter 4, verse 42. Then, of course, we fast forward, she says, to Easter morning, when Mary tells the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And John's gospel doesn't tell us if they believed what she said 
or if they tried in any way to verify. John's Gospel just continues the story by saying that on Easter evening, they were behind locked doors, afraid that the forces that had conspired to bring about the execution of Jesus might come next for them. Instead, Jesus comes into that secured room, saying, peace be with you. He shows them his hands and his feet. He's demonstrating by this show and tell that he is who he says he is. He is the risen Christ. The disciples rejoice, of course, to see him. And they tell Thomas what Mary had told them, that they have seen the Lord. Jesus or Thomas replies with the post-resurrection equivalent of, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Or the Samaritan woman's, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Or Mary's, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Bearing Nathaniel's skepticism and Mary's broken heart, Thomas needs more. Thomas will not be shamed into believing or shamed into at least keeping his unbelief to himself. Neither will Thomas ignore what he knows in order to believe something he does not know. Thus, Thomas's journey to faith make, makes this story especially important for the audience of would-be believers for whom John writes. Thank you, Mary Hinkleshore, for this commentary. I love the way she has taken a lot of my scattered thoughts and put them into a more cohesive form, the way she has used Thomas in context of the entire gospel, because I think we sometimes forget that this story is in the midst of that entire context. And so in John's gospel, there are these series of events of people telling other people that they have seen the Messiah and that they should come and see what they have, they themselves have seen to various levels of reception. That is one of the themes of John's gospel. And now we get Thomas, who is simply carrying on that pattern in John's gospel. So that pattern shows us that Jesus appears encounter, you know, Jesus appears in someone's life, they have an encounter with him, that encounter changes them in some way, and then they go back out into the world to share that with others. When was the last time or when was a time that you can think of when you had an encounter that made you say, I have seen the Lord? Maybe it's an encounter um, with you know, I don't even, I don't even know where to start. There's so many times when I don't necessarily phrase it that way. I have seen the Lord, but there are definitely times when I see that incarnation of Jesus, of God, because we all, we all are children of God. We all have God incarnate within us a little bit, not to the extent of Jesus, of course, but we still have that light of Christ within us. And sometimes that light shines through in other people and I have seen the Lord. Whether I recognize it as that or not, we have those experiences and maybe we do recognize it and maybe we just want to share that experience. And so we tell someone and they're like, well, okay, that sounds really great, but I wasn't there and I don't, you know, I, I don't know what you were seeing exactly. You know, there's different levels of skepticism when we tell people stories, but that is what we are called to do. We are called to go out into the world to continue to do the work that Jesus did when he was here on earth. We are called to share God's love with each other. And we are called to share our experiences of the risen Christ. It is our job to share that story. Just like the apostles and the disciples of the early church, we are called to tell what we have seen and heard. And so Mary concludes her commentary with this. As we experience the story of Thomas, we are invited to trust that Jesus will keep showing up alive and with a body that holds together the worst that has happened to him and his risen life. He is eager to reveal himself, not only through appearances, but also through the written word. 
Again and again he will offer that wounded living body to his own beloved ones, until finally the whole creation will be held fast in the peace he offers when he makes himself known. That is a beautiful paragraph um, as part of a really wonderful commentary. We read part of it. We didn't read the whole thing. I imagine that Mary Hinkle Shore is probably a pretty good preacher. Uh, she, she certainly writes some, some lovely commentary. So I want to thank her. I, I don't know her, but I want to thank her. The, uh, for writing that and for voicing, putting putting into words a lot of the feelings that I have had about Thomas, but also helping me to reframe that story in light of the gospel as a whole, reminding me that the, the, the come and see or the I have seen the Lord pattern is present throughout John. It doesn't just appear with Thomas's story. So... I hope that was interesting to you. I hope that opened um, up some new possibilities for thinking about this story for you. I hope that inspires you to go out and tell your story. Um, where have you seen the Lord? Maybe it's happened recently. Maybe you take time to try to see that every day. Maybe there's some big, huge event in your life where it's just so glaringly obvious that you have seen the Lord. But We've all experienced that in some way or another, whether it's a a tiny detail, whether it's a huge story, we've all experienced the risen Christ in our lives, and we are all called to go out and share that experience with others. That's all the time that we have for this week. I hope you will join me again on Sunday when we will be looking at the texts, the first of the texts assigned for the third Sunday of Easter. That would be April 15th still not August. I hope that you have a wonderful um, week between now and then. And um, in the meantime, of course, as I always conclude with, you can find all of our podcasts at www.gsmcpodcast.com. You can download those podcasts anywhere that you listen to podcasts, any app that you use for mobile devices. And you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram, GSMC Bible Study. Again, thank you for joining me. Join me again on Sunday for another episode. In the meantime, where have you seen the living Christ? Where have you seen the Lord? And as you're thinking of that, I hope that you will remember that you are a beautiful and beloved child of God. Thank you. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Bible Study Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.